I would like to announce that starting next week we have a winter break for two weeks. And so the next yeah, seminar will be in February. <laughs> so we have today Jan Gulk who will explain about simple non harmonic models so using projective geometry. Stressing the word simple. Yes, thank you. That's exactly what I wanted to say. So I should stand here. So, it is mostly going to be about projective geometry, a little bit less about uh, non holonomic kinematical systems. Uh, this is not really a result, those are not really results, those are some observations, and in particular a nice story, I hope, which touches upon some uh, topics that uh, we are going to study in a project with Pavel Verovsky. But this is going to be kept as simple as possible. So uh, we are going to consider non-holonomic systems. In particular, two very simple examples of these. So a non-holonomic system is something that is characterized by a configuration space. It's a mechanical system. You can just think of its kinematics. We do not consider the uh, dynamics of this system. Uh, it has some non-holonomic constraints on velocities. So at every point, the velocity has to satisfy some linear conditions, and th these conditions cannot be simply reduced to uh, moving on some submanifold of the configuration space. That is the meaning of the word non-holonomic. And we shall also use some additional structure at certain point. And one of the things that you can study, given such a system, is the, uh, are the local symmetries. So you could think of the group of symmetries of uh, the system configuration space plus constraints plus additional structure. Since we are mostly concerned with the local picture, we consider local symmetries, and we reduce that to infinitesimal symmetries, that is to vector fields whose flows preserve this data. And in some cases, it turns out that the algebra of local symmetries is a semi-simple V algebra. And this is interesting because semi-simple Lie algebras have a rich structure. So uh, if that happens, it is interesting to look at the corresponding semi-simple Lie group. So a group is a global object as opposed to the local symmetries. So it would be nice to have some uh, interpretation of this Lie group as acting on some extended configuration space. So that's why we want to complete the configuration space and it turns out that in some interesting cases, you can actually embed the configuration space into a flat variety. I will describe what that is. Sometimes called the generalized flat variety. And then this data of constraints and additional structure can be recovered from a certain double vibration. This is some data of some natural standard maps between flat varieties for this given big group. So the first uh, system we consider is the so-called ice skate. It is so cold because it doesn't really have much to do with an ice skate. It's extremely simplified, also sometimes called a knife. Uh, so it is the following system. Uh, I should draw perhaps here. Yeah. We consider an ice skate which moves on an ice ring, which is just the flat Euclidean space. And the constraint that we impose on it is that it always should uh, move in a direction tangent to the, to the blade. So it moves without skidding. So it's not going to move sideways. So the blade of the ice skate always has to be tangent to the trajectory. And we parameterize the configuration by position and angle, well, we can measure the angle with respect to some chosen axis, perhaps to this one. So this angle is going to be theta. So this is a simple description. We are going to make it a little bit more uh, geometric at some point. So the configuration space here is just R2 times a circle, 
the coordinates are x1, x2, and theta, which is <coughs> position and angle. And now the constraints simply tell us that the blade moves without skidding, so it always moves in a direction parallel to the blade. And that means that uh, the velocity satisfies this equation. In other words, this differential form evaluates when the velocity is zero. Well, you can check that in those coordinates, this is what tells us that it moves parallel to the blade. So this is a single linear equation on the velocities, since the configuration space is three-dimensional. At each point, we have a three-dimensional space of velocities. The single equation at each point reduces the space of velocities to a two-dimensional subspace. And we call it dp at a point b, and that's going to be the subspace of allowed velocities. And moreover, there is some extra natural structure on it, namely, uh, we can consider the following two uh, the following two vector fields, the following two velocities given at a point P. Uh, the first one is simply skating in a straight line. So here the point x1, x2 moves along theta with velocity 1, and we take the subspace of velocity spanned by the single vector. And the second one is the span of uh, the vector that corresponds to spinning. So uh, I guess this is called the pirouette in ice skating. And why? Because the first one, of course, is... <coughs> so those are, those are two particular... At each point, those are two particular vectors that satisfy the constraints. Ah. And since the space of admissible velocities yeah. is two-dimensional, this spans the but entire... this k is not... Uh, no, it is. Well, it is in certain sense canonical. Well, the point is, of course, what you mean. The subspace is canonical. Yes, the subspace is yeah. canonical. Exactly. That's why I'm speaking about the spark. Yes. So the extra data is uh, a splitting of the space of allowed velocities into a pair of one dimensional spaces. Because the, because the guy can, can just yeah. skate. And this is something you can recognize when, if you skate. Obviously, you can, yeah, yeah, you can distinguish. This is, 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 not, is not canonical. Well, depending on what you consider to be your structure. So we consider that to be part of the structure. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is definitely the, this is a part of the structure that you yourself uh, sense if you try to skate. Well, you have to skate with a single leg. For a skater, it is canonical. So for a skater, it is can canonical. Why it is canonical? Because he can make pirouette independently. You can tell if you are spinning at a point. And you can tell. No, no, no. Right yeah, I understand. Right. That. So these two-dimensional spaces yeah. can only. No, no, no. two-dimensional. Yeah, yeah, but also say, those one-dimensional. One 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 the, the, these are also different to make spinning, which is just this d over d theta, this k p space, then just going on straight line, which is open space. Yeah, yeah, okay, but this is related with the splitting of the configuration space. But locally, the configuration space is three-dimensional, and that's all. Oh, well, that but then there is distribution first that he must be if you tangent. Okay, okay. So, so this is this additional structure. Always have to be, his velocity always has to be you can consider tangent to the distribution. And I, should, I guess I should draw the distribution is still yeah. split because he can send going yeah. straight on. I'm going, going to have more of such diagrams, but if you want to see it now, consider the following diagram. Just the obvious two projections, right? Call this one P, call that one, uh, let's say, Q. So what you get here is that, uh, well, first of all, spinning at a point, I shouldn't call it P because I call it point P, but I use P everywhere else. Uh, I, I withdraw my question because every, this is obvious. However, my, yeah, uh, my is, intention was obvious. to draw your attention to the fact that this is a global structure, not local, because locally you you do not there is no, this is a structure that is related to the fact that this configuration space is a product of two manifolds. Yeah, locally you don't see. Excuse well, me, depending on what you want to consider, this okay, is part okay. of the data. Excuse okay. me, but if you have a trajectory, basically we know how to calculate the tangent vector, and that solves the problem. Where is the problem? And this gives the direction of theta. And no, but locally the space is just three-dimensional. And, yes. uh, and <laughs> no, no, 
where is the physical difficulty but what in is keeping the problem? It is keeping the the it is three dimensional and there is a constant. Yeah. Yes. So, but there is also uh, and this cons uh, constraint a priori that is This is a more. very good question, and this ah. is a question I, I would discuss if I were discussing curved versions of these. Namely, what is the basic structure that you need on this space? So the basic structure is to to be able to say what it means to skate in a straight line. So basically, you need what is called a projective structure. Okay. So to, this to, you need the notion uh, of, a, of a straight line. Perhaps black. Perhaps the, the thing is that the, the, the pro, this physical system, the kinematics of this physical system, is not quite non-trivial because the constraint is just on the velocity, it's not on the position. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So this, this is the constraint good. says that, that that you cannot skip, uh, as, uh, uh, as he yeah. says. So there, there's a constraint on velocities, which is sort of non-trivial constraint because you really consider constraint on, on, on configuration space. Right? That's why it's not so then, it's so the velocity it. space which a priori at every point is three-dimensional because the, the configuration yeah. space is three-dimensional is restricted by this constraint that you to two dimensions and it's an additional structure on, 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 on this configuration space, right? Instead of just going, having entire tangent space at each, each, each point a variable, you always have to move in such a way this is what has been said, and I think that, well, happily we have discussed that on this simplest example, because later we'll have the but more interesting one. But then the, velocity, the direction of the velocity fixes somehow the direction of theta, yes or not? No, they are independent. Because you said well, if you satisfy the constraint, then, then yes. The problem is that the, 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 the space from the very beginning, configurational space is three dimensional. Okay? And the constraint you put is not on the on veloc on, on position, position, but on velocity. So the question, general question is what kind of, of structure in the configuration space is imposed by by, by this condition which is the condition of velocity. Okay, so this is the problem. And, and you are feeling that the kind of of the system, system, we are still at the computer. We are on just my second slide. Kinematical, oh. yes. This, yes. Is, this is my second slide. I, I still have quite a few. So, what I said in the beginning was that we are going to have constraints, and this is this D, plus additional structure. So, my K and L is the additional structure. So, indeed, it is additional, but it comes from the mechanics of the system. So, this is why I want to consider it, and later I will explain why. So, okay, so this assignment to this two-dimensional subspace of the tangent space to each point is called the distribution. We call it D, and it splits into those two, into a direct sum of two rank one sub-bundles. So if we were just to focus on this distribution D, then what we get is what is called a contact distribution in dimension three, and all such things look the same locally. So there is really no data there. So what adds some variety into it is exactly the splitting into L and K. So now we consider the symmetries, namely the uh, Lie algebra of the vector fields whose flows preserve the data that we consider. So first we could consider the algebra of fields preserving the distribution D. And what we get here is infinite dimensional. It's an infinite dimensional <coughs> algebra that is related to the fact that those contact distributions in dimension 3 have no local invariance. So there is really nothing interesting there. This is just like with a symplectic structure, for example. But as soon as we add this extra data, namely as soon as we split D into a direct sum of two sub-bundles, it turns out that the symmetry algebra is the simple the algebra SL3 over the reals. So that's why we need this extra data. That's why we want to consider this extra data, because this gives us a nice, finite dimensional, and in particular, simple uh, Lie algebra of symmetries. So the question that we want to ask is whether we can somehow globalize this picture so that we can see an action of the group SL3 on some extension of this configuration space. Because then we would have some really geometric, not just algebraic picture that explains this symmetry. And that's what we are going to do. So uh, the first step, since we want to have a sort of a global action, is to compactify the ice rink. So we compactify the Euclidean plane, R2, 
to the projective plane, P2. So, uh, I don't know if you are used to thinking in terms of projective spaces. You can think of it as the space of rays in a three-dimensional space. But you, you can also compactify it by making yes. it a sphere. Yeah. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Well, and then taking a quotient by the quotient by by yeah. uh, So and you, you and have this, 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 part 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 yeah, yeah, this here is a double cover of, of P2. Because this is the real projective space. Everything is going to be real. So some people write R P2. Yeah. Okay, so we have compactified the ice ring. Now what are we going what are we going to do with the uh, configuration space? I will replace it with the complete flag variety of P2. So what is that beast? Well, this is a space that parameterizes flags. What are flags? A flag is a pair consisting of a point in the projective space and a line in the projective space, such that the point is on the line. So this is the space of flags, a very basic object you can associate with any projective space. It is complete because it goes through all the possible dimensions of linear subspaces of a projective plane. So now we have to describe the constraints. Well, it is very simple here, namely, uh, if we project a trajectory in this flag variety onto the ice ring, the P2, then the tangent vector to this uh, projected uh, trajectory at each instant has to be tangent to the line that is described by our trajectory. So in other words, uh, we can think of it as simply giving us some trajectory on P2 and a lift of this trajectory to the flag variety where the line we associate to every point of the trajectory is just the tangent line in P2. So this is just the, the, this is just the constraint. Which is the direction of the motion? Yes. Where the direction is understood as the one-dimensional subspace, one space. not as the angle. Yes. So I will have a diagram in a moment, but what we are doing here is we are, we are replacing angles with directions. So uh, we are taking a quotient by Z2 once again. Well, and now, uh, well, we had our split. So uh, tangent vectors satisfying the constraint give us our two-dimensional subspace that splits into those two one-dimensional subspaces. Skating in a straight line means that we are keeping the line constant quite tautologically, and spinning at a point well means that we are keeping the point constant and it is just the line that rotates around the point. These are just particular uh, situations. Yes, exactly. So, so if we consider velocities corresponding to this and velocities corresponding to that, they span a two-dimensional subspace and this is our subspace of admissible velocities. Uh, sorry, to which extent this extension is canonical? I mean... It is not canonical at all. Canonical it is canonical in certain sense. Universal. So, I didn't want universal to get into that. Universal for what? Like, for our purposes, let's say. No, no, he, well, what he wants to see how on earth you have S3 R symmetry. Exactly, yeah. What it does is, well, that. if you embed R2 into P2, well, what sort of an embedding is that? I didn't say how you embed, but I hope it is pretty clear. You embed it by adding uh, a projective line at infinity. And what it does is that, well, it doesn't preserve the Euclidean structure. You do not have a natural Euclidean structure on the real P2. Well, you know, we have, but we don't use it. Uh, what we use is the so-called projective structure. So in other words, straight lines in R2 get completed to straight lines in P2. In other words, projective lines. So this is all, the entire geometry is really projective geometry. It is based on the notions of points and lines. And these notions, these notions actually are, are nicely intertwined. Uh, namely, we have the so-called projective duality, a very classical subject, which unfortunately is, I guess, not taught at schools. Uh, namely, given a well, a projective plane as an abstract object can be simply considered as some axiomatically defined geometry. You do not need to use any algebra to define that. This is just a geometry that has notions of points and lines. Uh, every two lines intersect in a single point, unless they are the same line. Through every two points you have a single line, and you have the relation of incidence between points and lines. So, uh, 
a very classical thing is that you can actually swap those two notions. To so called the Zag. Uh, right. Or something like that. Right. Yes. But I don't know exactly. Well, okay. So, uh, in other words, you can uh, consider another projective plane where the points are going to be the lines of the original one, the lines are going to be the points of the original one, and the incidence relation is just a transpose of the original incidence relation. So this is called the dual projective plane to that one. And they are really in duality, so the fact that this one has a star and this one doesn't is just a convention. So uh, th this one is going to be the... Uh, the one that we distinguish, and that one is called the dual. So what is this incidence? Yeah. So this incidence, well, I, I wrote it this way because uh, we say that a point is incident to a line if it lies on that line. In other words, a line is incident with a point if it contains the point. And as I said, the incidence relation in the dual projective plane is simply the transpose. So it is really the same relation. So, uh, this duality uh, is mediated by the flag variety, in fact. So recall that the flag variety consisted of pairs of points and lines in incidence. So this is what is typically called an incidence variety, and you can think of it as of a subspace of the Cartesian product, because it contains of, consists of points and lines. But particular points and lines, namely the ones that satisfy the incidence relation, and now we know that we can write the incidence relation dually, and the flag variety is the same regardless of whether you start with the original projective plane or the dual one. One more thing that we want to see is a linear description of these objects. So the projective plane corresponds to uh, rays, so one dimensional subspaces in R3. The dual projective uh, plane can be, well, you can either associate it with rays in the dual R3, or you can associate it with simply planes in R3. Namely, if you consider a ray in the dual R3, R3 you take the annihilator, and there's a plane in the original R3, and then the flag variety uh, parameterizes flags, namely uh, pairs of a one-dimensional subspace sitting inside a two-dimensional subspace sitting inside R3. So, Obviously, since SO3 acts on R3, it also acts on those three uh, objects, and it is compatible with the relations of incidence. So SO3 acts on the projective plane, it takes points to points, lines to lines, and it preserves the incidence relation. It is, in fact, uh, up, to, up to a cover, it is uh, the automorphism up, 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 up to a cover. Yeah. So really, you should take PSO. Okay, so uh, what I said basically gives us a double vibration, namely we can consider the flag variety and two maps. An element of the flag variety is a pair, point and a line, we can either send it to a point, to that point, which is a point of P2, or we can send it to the line, which is a point of the dual P2. And now uh, we can nicely see our two subspaces, uh, in the, uh, our two sub-bundles in the distribution D. Namely, riding in the straight line means moving along fibers of Q, because we need to keep the line fixed. And uh, spinning means moving along a fiber of P, because it means uh, keeping the point fixed, spinning at a single point. So this Q star and P star simply means the tangent map to P and Q. Right, because those are subspaces of tangent spaces. Uh, yeah, please explain again what, what is a, just, just say, say it again, what is a fiber of a given point in the left and what is a fiber of a given point in the right? So the fiber over a point in here, if you look at it in the flag variety, it is a copy of P1, so it is just a projective line, and if you project it... But it's projective? I have it. Wait a Right? It's actually all here. the directions that you can so, move yeah. in. So, if you, if you consider a fiber of Q, then you get a line in the flag variety. If you project it down to the original projective plane, then you actually get this line that is described by a point over here. And similarly uh, for the fibers of P. 
if, if you consider a fixed point in the projective plane, you take the fiber of P and you project it down to the dual projective plane, then you get a line which consists of all lines through that point of the verb. So all the directions that you go through as you spin around the point. In, in this way you make spinning uh, sort of identical with moving... Exactly, and this is something I'm going to say and, in a second. And, and can you explain just in a simple picture using this cater, what really happened? I tried to, and I'll, I'll say it in a second, because th that's on my next slide, or maybe even here. I just wanted to, to recall that those two recover, in particular, the distribution D. So this is all the data that we have. And this is what I wanted to say. So, uh, if you consider a trajectory in the flag variety that satisfies the constraints, then by duality you can either consider it as a trajectory that describes an ice skater on the original projective plane, and in particular, the skater can ride straight or spin, or you can consider an ice skater on the dual projective plane, and that one spins when the first one rides straight, and rides on a straight line when the first one spins. So, so, so the, to, to each skater there is a, a dual, dual skater, dual, dual but, dual skater. but there is a problem with yeah. that. So, so now you want to imagine a pair of figure skaters performing in duality. <laughs> well, that would be nice, but uh, that would, first of all, that would require uh, unlimited uh, strength on the side of, the, say, the dual skater, because if the first one is doing a spin, a pirouette, then the second one has to ride really fast along the projective line. So but the but worst thing is faster the, 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 the worst thing is that you really have to skate on a compact ice rink. Well, yeah. So this is this is one this is one solution to the problem. You really have to skate on the land. One for the local purposes. Yes. This is a compactification. Yes. That's not exactly. Once you accepted that the dual points are lines, so this is clear. So because the skating is keeping the point constant. Okay. So it's a projective line. Yes. It is. It is not obvious that this what because the skater is a skater actually skating. Mental skating. skating. It is not not excluded that the, the guy what he is doing in his brain is just he's feeling sure. in the dual space. Yeah. Which is just this is definitely the right side of the gear to, to, to verify it experimentally. But well, the main problem is that of course to uh, uh, compactify to a projective plane we have to add a projective line, and well, a projective plane every two projective lines intersect. Yes. So yes. as soon as this guy or, or girl starts spinning that one will have to ride in a straight P1. And in that way, the skater will ride into whatever boundary you try to impose. So uh, as soon as you try to enclose the ring, you are sure that a disaster will happen. And so this is not safe. Could this be also done in the same way for a rolling coin? Which seems to be... Yeah, the rolling coin is more... Four dimensional. It's two dimensional. Yeah. Well, it depends on... Do you consider a rolling coin that can be inclined? Yes, yes, yes. Or a rolling coin that's no, no. upright? No, upright. Well, then so this, this is not monocyte. This, this is, is monocyte. 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 I'm getting there in a second. Is this there is a... Well, as you will see, this will not be an exact duality. Because then, actually, the, this, the, those two uh, legs of the double vibration will be different. So here they are abstractly uh, the same kind of a geometric object. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now we... Am I ready to... No, I'm not ready to get there yet. So first I just wanted to recall how we embedded the original configuration space in this compactified one. So R2 is an open affine subset of the projective plane. Over that we have this original configuration space that describes position and angle. So as soon as we have position and angle, we can consider a line through the given point at a given angle, but then the opposite angles give the same line, so this is really a two-to-one cover of the corresponding open subset. So this is how the simple description fits into that one. And now we recall that we had a natural action of SL3 on these objects, and this double vibration was equivalent under that action. So this action will extend the infinitesimal action on that side. And what we get is the following picture. So the group is SL3, 
Uh, our flag variety and our projective planes are homogeneous spaces, homogeneous varieties, that is quotients of SO3 by suitable subgroups, so-called parabolic subgroups, and the subgroups look this way. So uh, here we have P looks like that, Q looks like that, B is the intersection, there's the so-called Borel subgroup, and you can describe these as a stabilizer of a ray. So this one simply stabilizes the rays bound by the vector 1, 0, 0. This one is a stabilizer of a plane, and B is, well, it's a stabilizer of a flag because it's the intersection. It preserves both a ray and a plane. And that describes the global SO3 symmetry on this extended uh, configuration space. And in particular, this symmetry preserves our K and L, our two sub-bundles, because we have described them in terms of this double vibration as kernels of the tangent maps to these projections. So this is how it looks like for the ice skate. So this way I've done with the ice skate. That was the simplest possible. Does this global symmetry have some uh, simple interpretation in terms of conservation laws for this mechanical system? This is a very good question. You know, it would have to be controlled by the Yeah. It would have to be, yeah, definitely you, yeah. You cannot do it because it's supposed to be a, well, it's supposed to be a function of the, of the cotangent space. So you do have functions there. So I guess you, I guess you probably, probably you, you cannot extend the Hamiltonian without having some uh, poles. So I don't know. But, but it's a very interesting question. From the physics, from the very beginning, this SL3R yes, it's is, very is not obvious at all. Right? Yeah. And it's, it's, it is very unphysical, because uh, as I said in the beginning, what, what you really need on this R2 and what this SL3 preserves is only the projective structure, so the notion of straight lines. It doesn't preserve distances. It doesn't preserve angles. So all the <coughs> structure that you use to... Yeah, there must be some conservation law related to well, the, the problem is that this only this is only a but the dynamics, of the dynamics will dynamics. use yeah. this metric structure. Yeah. Huh? Oh, so this is not the 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 So, so what is really the consequence of? This no, but symmetry? definitely it, it it has something to the dynamics because if if you now consider a dynamical system with the Hamiltonian, this Hamiltonian must impose must enforce the motion which is. Uh, which is compatible with this constraint, okay? Yes. So it means that this symmetric how can somehow can yeah. will be reflected yeah. in the, in the dynamics. Yeah. But okay, yeah. but, this but this is the end of, this is, of the answer. But this is the end of the answer for the moment. For yes. the moment, yes. Uh -huh. So the purpose of that for me was simply to uh, show how for this, simply the geometric structure that is associated with this kinematical system, namely this distribution D with the splitting, how this infinitesimal symmetry of such a thing can be seen globally. And the real motivation behind that is that uh, once you have associated with this data on the configuration space some homogeneous space, some flat variety, uh, you can start to do Cartan geometry with that, so you can start to consider curved versions of the situation, but I don't want to speak about that. So now I move to the monocycle, which <coughs> could be called a, a spinning coin. Huh. I, I got this picture from Wikipedia, so I guess it is legal. So, uh, once again, we simplify that greatly. So what we consider here is the following configuration space. I guess I should draw it once again. So basically, we have a circle that uh, is rolling on the plane. So there is a circle that rolls on a plane. This is the upright coin. So I'll, just, I'll describe the constraints in a second. Let me just uh, describe the coordinates here. So we are going to describe this in the following way. We consider the abstract uh, circle, the abstract monocycle. Uh, we fix some angular coordinate on that. 
uh, well, we fix some Cartesian coordinate system on the, on the plane here. And now x1 and x2 is going to give us the coordinates of the point of contact of these two on the plane. So that's x1, x2. Uh, phi is going to give us this way. The, point, the location of the point of contact on the abstractly considered circle. In particular, you could mark this circle with a zero somewhere. And then uh, the third coordinate, theta, gives us a direction exactly. Which, once again, we measure as before. This is the angle theta. So those are the coordinates here. Yeah? So the point of contact and the angle. So you can see it as an extension of the, of the ice skate, where really. you just added one degree of freedom, namely phi. And now the constraints are the following. Uh, no skidding, as before, so it cannot move sideways, but also no slipping. So it, can, it cannot slip, it has to roll. So uh, I guess it's even easier to describe these constraints. Capital R is going to be the radius uh, of the circle. It's not really going to play a huge role in the sequel. Well, uh, those are the equations that have to be satisfied by uh, the tangent vector to a trajectory. And once again, we reduce at each point to a subspace of allowed velocities as before. This subspace is two-dimensional, and once again, we can naturally span it uh, by two uh, vectors. The first one corresponds to rolling in a straight line. So it's just as before, but we also have to adjust the coordinate phi as we roll. And the second one is just spinning, the way the coin spins. I don't know how they, I don't know how they do it on the monocycle. I don't think they can spin if they don't move. <laughs> no, they can You have to go to the circus and use. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> but this is exactly the same picture as before. So the only difference now is that we have an extra coordinate phi. So the, co the configuration space now is four-dimensional, but we still have around two distribution. So d is once again round two, so at each point we have a two-dimensional space of admissible velocities, but once again we can navigate the entire configuration space, and this d is known as the angle distribution. And once again we consider, consider the symmetries. If we just want to preserve the distribution, then once again there are no local invariants, which means that the algebra of symmetries of the distribution d the so-called angle distribution is infinite dimensional, but as soon as we add the splitting to our data, it turns out that the symmetry algebra is a simple Lie algebra SO32. And again, the goal is to understand why in a geometric way. So we want to globalize, we want to consider some action of SO32 on some extension of this configuration space. We want to see it geometrically. So, uh, we first are going to use the following trick. Uh, we can consider the trajectories in the configuration space. This is this guy. They describe the point of contact and the angle. And now we can project them to just those two factors. So, this is a three dimensional manifold that describes the point of contact. Only the point of contact, right? the product of the plane and the monocycle. And we call these projections, these images, reduced trajectories. And the observation is the following, that if you introduce the following Lorentzian metric on this manifold, so you take the Euclidean metric on the plane, you take the usual metric on the circle, but you take the other one with the minus sign, so you take the difference, then... Uh, I, I stole it from something that, that, that Pavel and Daniel Ahn did in a more complicated system. But here you can, you, you can use the same trick. So, uh, well, since as you roll on the plane, you also have to move along the circle, and you have to cover the same distance, then what you get is simply that the reduced trajectories are the null curves for this metric. So that's pretty fun. We can start with, on that level, we can consider the null curves. So this gives us some geometry. And in fact, since we consider only the null curves, that depends on the, on, only on the conformal class of G. So we can rescale this metric by any function, say positive function, eigenvalue curve, maybe non-zero function, and we still get the same null curves. So the actual structure that we want to see here is the conformal structure. And one more thing that I will do before I, uh, pro before I compactify, well, I complete
complete to something projected, is the following. Uh, instead of considering the circle, I take the universal cover of the circle. Well, that's pretty natural because if you, if you look at that system, the shape of this monocycle doesn't really matter that much as long as you, the coordinate you put on the, on the uh, edge of this monocycle is simply the length, the arc length or whatever. So you could have whatever shape and in particular you could consider simply the, the universal, universally covered circle. And that's convenient. So uh, we introduce uh, a coordinate Z here. Uh, where Z is simply the length, the distance measured along the uh, circumference of the circle. It's just in, in a way, you keep track of uh, how many exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Turns exactly. the circle makes. So this is just doing the universal cover. But that's going to be important in the next step. So now we rewrite this Lorentzian metric in this way, which is very nice. And we get rid of the radius. Okay. So. Now we uh, proceed, as one typically does in conformal geometry, uh, namely, uh, once you've got uh, a flat conformal structure, I'm not saying what flat means, that one is flat, uh, you can embed it, at least locally, into what is called a conformal quadric. So let me describe that. I consider... Because, because the conformal symmetries are, yes, are, are non-linearly yeah, okay, the original yes. thing, so you yes. want to go to such place where yes. it's linear, yes. yes. In fact, these conformal symmetries are going to be the SO3 too, but I didn't want to say it yet. So we consider R5 with the following coordinates. So X, Y, and Z were our original coordinates uh, on this universal cover of the configuration space. And I add two extra coordinates, U and V, and I consider on this R5 a quadratic form. So this is just what used to be this Lorentzian metric on my configuration space, and I add this extra term uv. So that one has signature 2, 1. This one has signature 3, 2. Well, we want to see SO3, 2, so things make sense. Well, and now you uh, projectify that. So you projectify this to the four-dimensional projective space. And since this is a homogeneous polynomial, uh, it cuts, cuts out a subvariety. In fact, it cuts out a quadric hypersurface. It's just a quadric. It's a it's a hypersurface in projective four space cut out by this quadratic form. Okay. Oh, uh, another way to, to look at it is that we simply projectivize the null cone. So we can consider the null cone for this. Uh, you can consider this as a metric, right? In R five, take the null cone and projectify. Projectivize. And this projectivization sits in P4. All right, so now let's observe the following thing. We want to describe the tangent spaces to this hypersurface. And there's a standard way to do it. Uh, let us take some non zero and null vector x inside R5. It's now, so h evaluated on x is zero. Uh, then, well, we can consider the class of X, so the ray spanned by X, as a point of the projective four space. Since X was now, this point, the class of X, is a point of the hypersurface, and the tangent space of the hypersurface at that point can be identified with the following uh, quotient. So this is the orthogonal complement uh, to X. It's not really a complement because it contains X. Yeah because x is a null vector. Or a yeah. uh, and then we uh, mod out by uh, the one-dimensional subspace spanned by x. Okay, so uh, the entire thing had dimension 5, this has dimension 4, so this quotient has dimension 3. Makes sense because s is three-dimensional, because it's a hypersurface in P4. So this is how we describe the tangent spaces. And uh, well, one more thing still keeping this x, this quadratic form induces a well-defined inner product on this tangent space. So why is it so? Well, the problem with, the, with defining an inner product here is that we took uh, a quotient, but this vector is now, that is first of all, and second, here we only take vectors that are orthogonal. So uh, the restriction 
of h to x perp descends to this quotient. So it defines an inner product on the tangent space. But one thing is that uh, this identification of the tangent space with this quotient depends on x. So if I rescale x, then this identification re is rescaled, and hence also this inner product is rescaled. And this is how it scales. So uh, if I rescale my vector x by some constant lambda, my metric gets rescaled. So what it really gives is a conformal structure. So this, in, this is how you induce this lambda may, may depend upon x. Yeah, this is the point. Yes, of course. Yes. So, yeah, this is a, you, not just a number or a function. The arbitrary quadrix, like also yes, like in complex well, spaces, also in like complex spaces. Well, yes, but then you get a complex uh, conformal structure. Yeah. Yes, yes, you can consider a, a complex projective space, and then the quadratic form has no signature, so there's really one up to coordinate change. So this gives us a well defined conformal structure on this quadratic, and uh, well, it is manifestly invariant under the group SL32. So SL32 is simply the uh, group, the subgroup of GL5 that preserves this quadratic form, so it preserves the quadric, and well, it preserves this conformal structure, since it was sure. naturally yeah. induced from H. So this is the uh, group of conformal automorphisms of this quadric. So why are we doing that? This is, well, this is because we wanted to embed our uh, space describing the points of contact, which had coordinates x, y, z, and a conformal structure, we want to embed it into this conformal quadric with its canonical conformal structure. So this is how the embedding works. In the simplest possible way, so we take the, take the coordinate u to be 1. This is the notation for points in a projective space. So this is understood up to rescaling. That's why you uh, use these, because you uh, the first uh, is uh, ratios. So the, we can set the first one to be 1, just by rescaling, assuming it is non-zero. And we want to embed it uh, into the complement. The first one was, it was u? Yes. V, u, yeah. U. Yeah. And the last one is v. v. So since I wrote h the way I wrote it, the only way I can make sure that this lands in my quadric is simply to uh, make v mm -hmm. be that. So h is 0 on such guys. Because it's x squared plus y squared minus z squared minus 1 times that. <laughs> so everything comes the same. Okay, so that's what I said. Uh, this way, this universal cover of the point of contact space is contained in the quadric. And moreover, if you look at the pullback of the natural conformal structure on the quadric, it pulls back exactly to our conformal structure on this guy. So to x squared plus y squared minus z squared. So we have embedded this R2 times R1 together with the conformal structure conformally into uh, this quadric. There's one more thing that is interesting to note. So uh, that thing described the point of contact. We could in particular project it to the point on the plane at which the monocycle sits. So if we now look at it from this projective viewpoint, this map extends to a projection. So projection here means a rational map. So it is not defined everywhere. If you, if you project, it's just like if you do projection from a point, then obviously there is no uh, way to send the point somewhere. So this is a projection from a two-plane. So it is defined on the complement of a two-plane. This projection is given simply by uh, mapping this, to the point in P2 described by 1xy. So in particular, this projection restricts to a well-defined map from S with a single point removed into P2. And note that this point uh, is, does, is not contained in the image of, of that. This will also be important because one thing I will want to say later is that uh, lines in here are mapped by this projection into lines over the that's how projections work. After all, we are doing projective geometry. So projections are exactly the maps that preserves points, lines, and incidents. Well, okay. 
So uh, we are done with the blue part, that one that described the uh, point of contact, up to doing a cover, but that doesn't matter. So then we have the, this one, which should be red, actually, and this one was the tether part. Direction. Yes, exactly. That one was the direction. So we are going to mimic what we did before, so replace uh, angles with tangent lines. Uh, and it turns out, well, those should be really lines in P4, but they should be contained in S, because we want to move along those lines. It turns out the projective lines, so simply P1s inside P4, which lie on this quadric, are precisely the isotropic lines. So what are isotropic lines? Uh, there is a nice linear description. So lines in the projective space are planes in the linear space, in the vector space. Now, once we have an inner product here, we say that a line is isotropic inside P4 if the corresponding plane is isotropic inside R5. So in other words, the uh, inner product restricted to this plane is zero. So totally null. One more thing, so projective lines lying on S are the isotropic lines, this is one thing. Another observation is that projective lines uh, lying on S are precisely the null geodesics of the conformal structure. So uh, a conformal structure has a well-defined notion of null geodesics. It doesn't have geodesics as such, but it does have well-defined null geodesics. And that makes sense because uh, the reduced trajectories are null. So in particular, those null geodesics are a special example of reduced trajectories. Excuse me, null geodesics is a narrower narrow category than the null curves? Yes. Yeah. So, so these are conformal geodesics which are null. Yeah, so you can, you can choose a metric from the conformal class and consider the null geodesics, and that doesn't depend on the choice of the metric in the class. If you change the representative, yeah. then only the parameters yes, exactly. exactly. Which sort of can be seen from that, <laughs> exactly, because this is, this is the flat case at least. Uh, where uh, the null geodesics simply follow from the projective structure uh, and well, yeah, projective structure and projective lines on the quadric. Okay, I'm running out of time soon, so uh, I need to introduce a few other objects. So before we were describing the compactified, extended configuration space by means of a flag variety. So here I'm going to uh, use the isotropic flag variety. So as before, this consists of uh, points contained in lines, so purse XL in the flag variety, but now I require the line to be contained in the quadric, which is the same as saying that I require the line to be isotropic, which also implies that X uh, belongs to the quadric. So if it were represented by a vector, the vector would be null. And the linear description follows. So this one parameterizes the following flags of subspaces. We have a one-dimensional subspace contained in a two-dimensional subspace inside, uh, inside R5, and the quadratic form restricted to each of these has to be zero. So those are now rays contained in totally now plates. And, well, since uh, we have a linear description for that, and since SO32 acts on R5, preserving our inner product, our quadratic form, it also acts on this uh, flag variety. It also acts on the, on the quadric S, and this action is compatible with incidence. One more ingredient I will need is the so-called funnel variety of S. So this is simply the space that parameterizes projective lines contained in S. So I can consider that as a subspace of the dual projective uh, for space. Okay, so I simply take the flag, the isotropic flag variety, and I forget about the point. I just consider the lines. So in other words, those are simply the isotropic lines inside B4 for that given quadratic form. And as before, I have a double fibration. It looks very similar to the previous case, only that now I have the isotropic flag variety. So this consists of first a point and a line. If I consider the point, I project down to the quadric S. This is the guy that carries the conformal structure. If I consider the line, I project down to the final variety of S. So this answers the question whether I have 
the same sort of duality for the rolling coin. It's not really a duality because those are different, uh, different, different uh, spaces. But different there is a dimension. double vibration. Yes, they have different dimensions. Uh, they are different. But there is a double vibration, so there is something happening, at least, if you had some... So the Well, this has dimension 3, and that one has dimension... Uh, what? Do you know that? No. Can you say that out of your head? Uh, I have to look at the... W once I write down those matrices, it's, it's very clear. So let's wait for the, for the, matri for the matrices describing these. But as before, I can describe my one-dimensional uh, Sub-bundles L and K as the fibers. So once again, curves tangent to L, this is the guy that describes writing in a straight line, are the fibers of the projection onto, onto the Fano variety. Well, after all, the Fano describes lines in S. So if I take such a fiber of Q, so I fix a point in the Fano variety, which means I fix a line in S, I look at the fiber, I, pro I project it down to S. I get the line, tautologically, and this is the same as an algeodesic S. So in other words, if I move along uh, this one-dimensional, this rank one sub-bundle L, I'm moving along an algeodesic S. And one more thing is that... Oops, I don't want to show that here. So one more thing is that if now I project from S to P2, so projection to P2 is the projection that I described before, the one that projects down to the extension of this plane. So namely, I just look at the trajectory that the uh, monal cycle traces on the ground. I simply get a line in P2. So this is writing in a straight line. And on the other hand, that one preserves the point of contact, both on the plane and uh, on the circle. So it simply corresponds to spinning. Yeah, you can, you can compute the dimension from here. So that, that, that was three-dimensional. Uh, oh, that one should also be three-dimensional. Right? Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry, that one is also two-dimensional. The dimension is this. Yes. yes. Okay, and now let's see how this original picture embeds in here. So first of all, I can embed the Euclidean ground into P2. Then I have this space of points of contact. This is an open locus inside the quadric. Then I have my original uh, configuration. configuration space up to a double cover over here. It is a two to one cover, a double cover of this isotropic flag variety. So this is how it embeds. And now, once again, recall that we had an SO32 action. This is my last slide. Uh, almost. So uh, SO3 acts on those flag varieties. They turn out to be homogeneous spaces for suitable subgroups. So it's exactly as before. So P is a stabilizer of a null ray. Q is a stabilizer of an isotropic plane. And B is uh, the intersection of these. So these, once again, are homogeneous varieties for SO32. And this double vibration is equivariant. And I guess. That is it, because now uh, we see how the global SO32 uh, symmetry works here. So I think I will stop here. I will not show you the rest, but there, there is more to tell. You could what is the bonus? Well, the bonus was... Uh, uh, I, I can show it, okay. But I'm not going to say anything about that. So the bonus, then. Uh, so we have described the ice skate and the monocycle. We had the symmetry algebras. And, well, you can classify semi-simple D algebras, at least over the complex numbers, uh, by the types, the Dodinkin diagrams, for example. So this one has Lie type A2, that one has Lie type B2. Uh, 2 is the uh, Lie rank, is the dimension of the Cartan subalgebra. Well, so the only other simple Lie algebra type of the complex numbers of rank 2 is G2, uh, the exceptional one. So the question is, uh, is there a system that realizes G2 somehow? And the answer is that, well, you can do it with the, with, the, with the Zorb, so we have to get one dimension further. So those things, well, this is based on observations of Cartan, but the, 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 that was described by Montgomery and Bohr, and then by, by Pablo Borowski and Daniel Am. So uh, they, in particular, showed how to uh, associate uh, this G2 
uh, a curved version of the G2 geometry to rolling. But this one is, is pretty special. You cannot roll this uh, zorb on the plane, as in that picture. This is the wrong picture. Uh, the only case where you actually do get a global, well, uh, actually a global G2 symmetry, you do not need to compactify, is if you roll the zorb on another sphere, mm -hmm. and if the ratio of the radii is 1 to 3. So that makes sense because you don't really want to roll this on a plane. It's much more fun if you have a hill. So you have to put your zorb on a hill whose radius of uh, curvature is three times the radius of the zorb. And then if you switch off gravity, that doesn't make sense anymore, uh, you do get G2 symmetry. But I guess this is kind of really How about the real bicycle? Pardon? How about the bike, the real bicycle? Yeah, the bike, I guess, is much more the complicated. Bike is angle uh, Distribution. Uh, no. That one was also angular distribution. Well, yeah, because in the bike you do not have. Well, you have two angles. I, I imagine it was the bike. Angle really but, but, angle angle distribution. Yeah, but but it is angle distribution. But perhaps you can still split it. Yeah. So perhaps you do get some kind of symmetry. Yeah, you could also consider, consider the, the bike. Okay, so I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you.